blocks of butter. Whereas sugar comes as grains and you scoop out the amount you need and milk comes in jugs and you pour out the amount you need, but butter comes in a block. So how many blocks of butter do I need? And so everything gets scaled to that. Uh, and then uh, we make a comparison table, put them side by side, you look and you see, oh, this one, you know, these two have a couple of the same things, these two have a couple of things missing, you bake them all, you taste them, you find out which one you like the most. And we liked two of them that were very similar and we just kind of went halfway in between those two and, and it was a hit. Uh, so the problem is you can't really scale up in a small kitchen because you have to hand roll and hand rolling a soft, flexible dough like that uh, to a uniform thickness every time and on any sort of scale becomes pretty difficult. So, uh, we had a guy from Guatemala come in. Oddly, I had a woman from Guatemala call me today to, to order today's lychus uh, for her husband. Um, but he came in and said, can you please make a today's lychus cake for my wife's birthday? And so we did exactly the same procedure that we used for the alfajores. Uh, we got the four recipes, we made them, we put dulce de leche on top to give it an Argentinian flair, and it became our top seller. It's still our top seller to this day. Um, we, we scaled the recipe up three times in, in the first uh, six months, and that became our standard recipe. It's now been scaled up six times since then. And uh, on a week like Thanksgiving or Christmas, we'll probably make the largest scale of it two or three times. Uh, a scale, the scale we make makes, uh, on our largest scale, about probably over $2,000 worth of today's latest per batch. It's a lot of today's leches. It's probably one of the most expensive things we make because the cost of sweetened condensed milk is insane. Not as insane as chocolate. <laughs> so, okay, wholesale re requests. So this is, we're still in Framingham and we're not a licensed wholesale provider. And, and suddenly one of my employees comes running to the back and is like, oh my God, Jules, my hero Franco is out there eating your gelato. It turns out he loved Franco's pizza and he'd been on Framingham when, Fra when Franco used to go around with the truck. And so I go out and I talk to, to Franco and, and you know, he says, you know, I, I sell this award-winning gelato. They, this one is a Massachusetts one that wins all sorts of awards they brag about. And this one's from New Hampshire and wins all sorts of awards. But I come here because yours is better than mine. Um, so can I please sell your gelato? So Franco's actually has changed ownership since then. Franco's retired. Franco retired. Uh, they still sell our gelato. Uh, and and they, they do quite a bit of it for us. Uh, other restaurants started to ask to sell wholesale, today Slages, uh, tiramisu, and I, again, um, it, we began just, it, it became just a logistics nightmare of trying to move different products between different storage facilities and keep everything safe and moving in the kitchen, out of the kitchen, supplies in, products out, um, and keep everything else going. I know about the art shelves who's there. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> it still happens sometimes. I resent Ashland, but oh. Yep, it still happens sometimes, I know. I know. <laughs> so we moved production to Ashland. It's only 10 minutes away. Um, it, it just became clear that we were onto something. Um, I quit my day job to help with the growth. There was, there was no way we could build the facility without me helping to manage. Um, it took over two years and a million dollars to get the new space up and, um, and running. It, it pretty much bankrupted us. Um, we didn't expect it to cost as much. Uh, anytime you're trying to start a business, it costs way more than you think it does. The uh, local town officials will always slow you down. They will never accept what you give them and they will always want more. And it, eventually we, we actually, uh, fortunately through the Fort Myers market, you know, we had contacts with the local select board and had to say, you know, see, this sounds like, it feels like they're picking on us here, the things they're asking. And, and suddenly it got approved. But, you know, it gets to a point where every time an inspector walks through the door, it's it's $5,000 to do something else. And before you know it, you're, you're repairing things that aren't even in your space because, well, you know, it might affect your space. Um, 
So we, we, we have emergency lights in our 12 by 12 walk-in freezer, which I've been told is unique to Ashland because they said <laughs> do this. Uh, that, that was actually the straw that broke the camel's back. But <laughs> I should mention that our 12 by 12 walk-in freezer also has a glow in the dark uh, get, out of, get, out of, get out of here handle. Sorry, that came with it. Uh, so that's our Ashland design that took a very long time to design. That's 7,000 square feet. Um, and essentially, this, this was for Sam. She insisted that we have a laundry machine, a laundry facility, and, which does help because we, we generate a lot of dirty towels and uniforms. Um, we have a dedicated chocolate room. I'll show a little of the equipment there. So all we do in there is chocolate. Uh, dedicated gelato making area, separate area where we do lower gluten work as well as make all our frozen dinners, which we didn't even do at the time, that came later. Um, we have a room where all we do is make batters and doughs and fill croissants and fill pie shells and that sort of stuff, and a room where all we do is bake and decorate cakes right next to it. And then really the keys, there are the fridge and freezer up there uh, so we can store everything we make. I, I I think at some point we're going to need a bigger freezer. Um, the customer service area was really the last thing to be added on. Uh, the people who owned the building came to us and basically said, hey, you know, there are 500 people working in this building and the number one complaint is there's nothing to eat. Uh, they're all gonna complain if you're making it smell like food and, and not doing anything. <laughs> so we, we put, put that in. Literally the day we opened, the, the people in, in the building decided that they were gonna move out. Uh, so uh, we, we had to find another business plan to go to fix that part of it. Um, so really the, some of the most critical equipment for our growth, uh, I would say has all uh, the way to the left there is that sheeter. So that sheeter is two feet wide and about 10 feet long. Each belt is four feet and it has two rollers right in the middle. And so they roll your dough and you just kind of go back and forth on the conveyor belt, making it thinner and thinner. And sometimes it breaks and you have to change or put it back in the fridge. Most of our recipes work only at very narrow temperature ranges. If a customer comes in and needs help while you're rolling out pie dough before you finish, you either have to tell them, sorry, you're gonna have to wait, or you have to fold everything up, put it back in the fridge, let it sit for two hours and start again, because by the time you come back in five minutes, the dough is not workable anymore. So we try to have dedicated staff that don't have to work with customers, but uh, it's not always possible to have them, them there when you need them as, as much as you need. But that is probably the workhorse of our kitchen. We can roll out where we used to be able to make cookies for 50 alfajores a day. Uh, we, can, we can do a thousand, no problem, in a five hour shift there. We do pasta for our lasagnas there. We just made a batch of probably 50 large lasagnas yesterday. Uh, all of our pies for Thanksgiving come off that in a two week period. We make about 500, 600 pies. And in the summer, we do probably between 75 and 150 mini pies a week for farmer's markets, depending how many farmer's markets we're going to. Um, the center, I have two chocolate tempering machines on the left there. The one closest was my original. Um, the reason for having a second one, you need to temper milk chocolate and you need to temper dark chocolate. Milk's an allergen. So if you wanna do anything that's dairy free, um, you either have to, every time you use milk chocolate in the machine, clean the entire machine out, which is dangerous because getting water in the machine is, is the way that you get mold. So you want to clean as little as possible. Um, it's one of the few things that you want to clean as little as possible. Um, and having one dedicated milk, one dedicated dark just means on the same day we can work milk if we need to, we can work dark if we need to, and, and we do that to be People can work together, we have them separated. And then of course, the pasteurizer there was a little bit of a, a kick in the pants. We, we had a, another pasteurizer at the Framingham store that was okay for Framingham, but, and we moved it, we got everything set up, and then uh, we went to get our state wholesale license, and they said, oh, this pasteurizer is illegal. Now that pasteurizer was beautiful. It, it mixed everything perfectly, it worked fast, it was easy to use. Uh, this one is like clunky 1960s technology, but this is what the federal and state government want. 
<laughs> so, because it has a strip chart recorder. So that's what we use now. The old process took us about three or four hours. The new one takes us about eh, 14, 15 hours, start to finish. Yep. But it makes twice as much. And it was definitely a sudden, unexpected $30,000 expense after we were all set up and, and thought everything was fine. So this is just our, you know, things that were impossible before. Um, really, we couldn't make more than 30 pies a week in, in Framingham, uh, even the mini ones. And I didn't even start making the chocolate alpohores that you just tried until we were in Ashland. We just did the Mycenas. Oh. Do you feel like passing out other samples? I have today's slides just there. I forgot all about that. I just didn't want to load people down with too many things at the same time. <laughs> okay, so then uh, three months after we, we got open and everything, the pandemic of course hit. And uh, of course it put an awful lot of people out of business. Um, so we, we had started selling a lot of large cakes. Suddenly, every large cake was canceled. We started making smaller cakes that, that you know, were intended for a small family and a home without a lot of guests. Um, and having those ready all the time, that helped. Uh, most of our wholesale dessert business disappeared overnight. Uh, a lot of the restaurants we worked with no longer exist. Um, offices closed in our building, so the lunch business was gone. And one of the things you have to remember is that dessert's a luxury. People don't eat dessert every day. They eat savory food every day. So we, we actually created a line of, of take and bake frozen dinners. Um, people love them. Basically comfort food. You like them? Everybody likes the chicken pot pie. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, more chicken than anybody else's pot pie. I, I know that from comparing ingredient labels. Most, most of them have broth or water as the first ingredient. Chicken is legitimately our first ingredient. Um, and so, you know, people still need to, to have something in their freezer that they can throw in. They don't want to cook every day. They're too tired. They have work schedules, everything else. It's good to keep around. And so, you know, it didn't help us really thrive, but it, it certainly helped us to survive. We got the word out through a lot, through breweries, because breweries, uh, there was, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but um, suddenly could not serve beer unless they served food with the beer. So that was one of the rules we had during the pandemic. And a lot of breweries didn't have kitchens, so they needed somebody to come in and, and start um, serving food right away. The other thing that helped us a lot was the hot chocolate bomb craze of, of 2020 through 2021. I don't know if anybody remembers the hot chocolate bomb craze, but it was a craze. Uh, we had stores insisting that we wholesale to them, so I was not going home and was up all night making as many of these as I could. I would say this was a real turning point from perspective of, you know, we stopped losing money and going further into debt with that and, and started holding our own. Um, the thing is, we were already set up being a chocolatier. We know how to work chocolate. We have molds. And uh, we make ours differently than everybody else. Most, most people, you see spheres. Uh, spheres are a lot more work. They're half empty. They take up a lot of space. And a lot of the places that did it are kind of home bakeries or bakeries that don't know how to work chocolate. So you get a lot of candy melts and things like that that don't really melt or taste that much like chocolate. Um, we are already known for chocolate and for hot chocolate. And we use our own cocoa powder mix that we make for our in-house hot chocolate in them. Um, and Sam's special touch on it was the uh, Lucky Charms marshmallows which we, we buy about 20 pounds a year now of Lucky Charms marshmallows. That year we used, we used about 40. But uh, as, as one of the stores buying them from us said, it's, it, this is worse than the Beanie Babies back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they were coming and actually packaging for them, packaging them for us to save time so they could get them faster. And um, of course, I didn't know you were coming, Susan, but I, I should have guessed since you've, you've mentioned it. Um, 
So there was a very well-timed article in the source Valentine's Day that year, and we had just been really super prepared, and we really put a lot of work into it, and you interviewed us for it, or you had somebody interview us for it, and uh, it, it wound up being, you know, our uh, biggest sales day in history, but of, of course, we all know it also ended tragically. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the in-store growth part, but I did want to throw out for anybody who might think about, um, you know, starting a business, the role of farmer's markets in our development. Um, so th our initial concept of, of gelato at farmer's markets really didn't, didn't ever get a lot of traction. Um, you know, if you have an afternoon farmer's market, there's always a lemonade vendor there, and, and parents wisely uh, make their kids choose one, one sweet while they're there, and usually a big glass of, of liquid will win out over a small frozen dessert any time. Um, and, you know, Saturday morning, not the hugest time to eat frozen desserts. People have other errands to run. I know, but it, uh, the day to speak. <laughs> we do sell some, but the data speak. <laughs> uh, so people have other errands to run. They're ne necessarily going home, so you can't necessarily sell them a pint. It's going to melt in their car. And um, the other thing about farmer's markets is, is they all have non-competes. It's part of the farmer's market charter that, that everybody uses. Um, you know, so, uh, oh, well, we make croissants, too. Could we bring those? Oh, no, bakery. Bakery X makes those. Oh, well, can I bring chocolates and turtles and caramels? Oh, no, you, you know, we have a vendor who does that. Oh, well, how about our alfajores? No, no, there's, there's already somebody who makes alfajores. Uh, how about brownies or coffee? And oh, those are spoken for. Um, but, you know, the, the other part of it is you don't give up. Um, so, what concepts you can get in front of people, you get a lot more people in a short time because they're already at the farmer's market so they have a chance of seeing it. Um, and you know, you start to work things in. It's like, oh, you can't bring croissants, but hey, we have these savory croissants. We notice they don't make those. Oh yeah, yeah, you could bring warm savory croissants. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll let you do the Spanish and bacon ones. Nobody does anything like that. And oh, yeah, yeah, oh, you're making, uh, Chocolate bars, bean to bar. Well, yeah, the cho person who sells chocolate here doesn't do anything like that. Yeah, you could do that. And oh, uh, well, yeah, nobody brings breakfast sandwiches. Uh, you could do that. And, but then it's only at a farmer's market that has electricity or, or lets you use a generator. And um, you know what? Oh, you make pies now. Oh, my god, nobody wants to make pies. Sure, you can sell pies here. Uh, brownies, cookies, oh, hey, that vendor stopped coming. Uh, you can do that now. And oh, hey, the alpha vendor, alpha whore vendor now only comes once every second week. You can do that too. Um, so slowly over time, we went from being very constrained and bottled up to having a very large operation at the farmer's market. And you know, when you first started out, if you look on the left-hand side, shows you where customers stand in kind of a 10 by 10 tent. Pre-pandemic, the gelato cart was up, up at the front, front and center, and then as we started to add the limited pies and started to add the breakfast sandwiches, we kind of added some more tables in there. But again, you're mostly testing concepts. You know, we, we were pulling in maybe 200, 300, Four hundred dollars, depending on the farmers market, uh, just so you know, you can't pay an employee for that, right? If you're paying employees and paying for the food and the truck and everything else, it's it's not going worth going for anything other than publicity. And the interesting one is in the center. We would have expected everything to go down during the pandemic, but one, people were looking for a way to get out of the house, and there were a lot of restrictions, so a lot of vendors couldn't go. Um, everything had to be prepackaged, and we couldn't sell scoops anymore, so we moved the gelato cart away from the front into the back and just put pints in it. Now, one of the things I came to realize is that the gelato cart was actually hurting us. And so when the people show up and they don't want gelato and they see the gelato cart, they avert their eyes. And so they don't see your baked goods. But 
<laughs> you have the gelato carts hidden where nobody sees it, and all you have is baked goods and pies and croissants up front, you draw people in. And so the people who want your gelato will still ask for it, and you can go to the back and scoop it. So our sales really quadrupled just by doing that. Now, in our kind of post-pandemic era, we've, we've added the cooking back in, and a lot of the other vendors haven't come back. Um, that we've had to cut a few things that we had before. Uh, we've added more packaged cookies, brownies, and people just pick those up. I've got some examples of those there. Uh, once you put things in packages, people love them a lot more. Um, I don't know why, but then, uh, you know, it got to the point where it's, it's now, it went from not profitable in any way and probably losing money to during the pandemic kind of lifeblood and to post pandemic, it's, it's actually profitable for us to go to farmer's markets now. And it's taken us seven years to figure out how to make money out of farmer's market and a pandemic to figure out how to do it. But if we hadn't been prompted to get that gelato cart out of there and not serve scoops, I'm not sure we would have ever figured it out. Okay, so where I'm hoping to head, uh, chocolates, you know, continue to innovate in the chocolate space. Um, you, on the front counter here, we have a lovely maple fudge that my son just made a few days ago. We just started doing fudge. We decided we'd do it for Christmas this year. People ask us every Christmas and we don't do it. So we said we're gonna do it. Uh, it's delicious and it's already selling. The other one is actually a holdover from our trip to Vienna. And so I've taken the Argentinian uh, inspired tanguito, but, but gone to a whole different place. Has anybody here ever had a Mozart kugel? Oh, one, yeah. two, two, two people have had Mozart kugel. So if you spent time in Europe, especially in Austria and parts of Germany, um, they won the award, uh, I believe, World's Fair in 1895 in Paris uh, for most innovative chocolate or confection. Um, it's essentially a homemade rum-flavored pistachio marzipan, a layer of German hazelnut nougat, and a layer of uh, traditional marzipan, which is flavored with rose water, inside of dark chocolate. So we've taken and made a very nice big version of that. Uh, tasting the components um, separately, uh, I wasn't sure how it would how it would go, but as soon as I put them all together and put them in the dark chocolate and took a bite, I, I was right back in Austria. <laughs> so, um, the, the other one, you know, a lot of things come up very slowly over time. Uh, the salty candy pecans are, are a fun example of something we just started last year. Um, and we've been making chocolate bars with chopped up salty candy pecans for, for years now, and, and people often say, oh, this is the best thing I've ever put in my mouth. But people can be kind of, you know, some people are extreme when they mention things like that. Um, but we had decided we needed to, to make a batch right before Thanksgiving last year, and then we didn't have time to do anything with them, so they sat on a tray in the kitchen and back, and every time our employees went by, they couldn't help themselves but eat them. So we said, why aren't we just selling these? So now we sell them, they're, they're really good. Um, so the alfajores, I, I think um, I would love to see alfajores popularized here like they are in South America. And um, certainly I, I have a friend with empanada shops in uh, Worcester and Newton. She goes through about 300 or more of our alfajores a week and we go through another 300. And if it's farmer's market season, another couple hundred on top of that, depending on, on whether the other vendor is at the farmer's market. Um, the frozen dinners, uh, I was really shocked by this. People actually give them away as Christmas gifts. <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, it was two days before Christmas, the first year we were making them and they were flying off the shelves. I'm like, who eats Christmas? chicken pot pie for Christmas dinner. I said, oh no, no, th this is a gift for my neighbor. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, cakes, um, you know, I never intended to be a cake decorator. Uh, decorating cakes is not my favorite thing in the world, but I'm halfway decent at it now and pretty fast. Unfortunately, uh, we lost our, our cake decorator shortly after Sam died. Um, and I was never really able to find a permanent cake decorator after that. Um, 
a lot of people in the modern economy are not used to being on their feet all day every day. And a, a lot of people who think they'd like to be cake decorators uh, um, have come and tried, but they usually don't make it more than a couple weeks. So it's not that I send them away, it's, it's that they say, so I've been in pain for the last two weeks. So um, that's a, a problem that, that I've had. I have uh, somebody now who helps us out a couple times a week, which um, is important because I need time to make chocolate because uh, training people to make chocolates is uh, very difficult. It's, it's probably the most difficult thing we do is make chocolates. And, uh, making a good ganache it's not just a recipe, it's a feel, and it's seeing and touching and knowing what's happening to it and tweaking and getting everything right and using it at the right time. So that, that part, that stuff's a lot harder to train than baking, and baking's already hard enough to train. It's chemistry, you once told me that it was chemistry when you were doing that back it's chemistry and material science, a lot of material yeah. science. But you have that knack for the way combining something <laughs> I wouldn't like, raspberry and chocolate. And you said, oh yes, just try and try it. Everybody and loves raspberry and chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I don't know, I don't want to do chocolate. <laughs> and so you had me try this, you had, and I said, ah, yes, Jules, I can really taste that part of the chocolate, and yep. it's good. It really goes with the Peruvian chocolate nicely. Yes. I think this might be the end of it. Yep, that's where I stopped. So, but I can answer any questions you have about chocolate. I, I don't know if everybody was hoping to learn how to make chocolate today. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say something about you. Okay. In the early days when you were still running around the back of the kitchen up at the Oh, I'm still running around the back of the kitchen. <laughs> well, training him. And so um, you were talking about your truffles and you were trying to have a, a, another, and one more truffle in the group. Yep. And I had gone up to Russell to the farmer's market and the maple syrup people were there. Yep. So I said, can I have a sample because so I ran it down to you and I said, here's the sample. I know you're looking for something, how about a maple truffle? So I went shopping, I came back, you had made a maple truffle in the kitchen like that, and we tried it and it was delicious. Oh, thank you. Remember you. That? I remember that. It was a I lot do of remember fun. that, yeah. yeah. I, I actually have a honey ganache, milk and honey ganache with me today that I can put into cups after. I didn't have time to, to portion it before the I came. The maple ganache was delicious, that's the other thing. It's the real taste. <laughs> It was, it's real food and it was really good and you have a way of combining it with the right chocolate. And that's all, because oh, I have the same way you like that. So right now, I mean, Ashland is closed for the year, but Ashland is really our main one. We do the indoor market in Natick. Uh, we did the old Framingham market. I need to try the new Framingham market. Uh, the old one did not work for us at all. But did not, it just didn't work. Uh, we did Belmont. Um, we've tried Hopkinton in the past. It might be fun to try their indoor market, but um, I, I think they just don't have enough attendance. I think Framingham now has enough attendance. It, it looked kind of well attended this year. Yes. Um, the, you know, it's hard to have a good farmer's market, I think. The, it's, you need activities for kids. You need live music or some form of music or entertainment. And you need a, a wide variety of vendors. You need parking and you need a time of day that, that people can come. Um, so putting together a farmer's market that attracts people uh, is really difficult. Ashland formula works really, really well. I think um, Belmont had a formula that worked really well. Uh, and they were Thursday afternoons, just like Framingham Market. And so I, I was always a little disappointed that the old Framingham Market didn't work very well. But again, I, I heard that the new Framingham Market is working well. Uh, the hardest part about trying anything for us is um, it is a major, major undertaking for us to participate in a farmer's market. I, I don't think people realize how difficult it is um, most of the things that we take, like pies, are very perishable. They, they don't last that long. Um, you need the time to make the pies, bake the pies, package the pies. Um, you need somebody to cover for me who's not going to run out in the middle of the afternoon because their shift ended or their babysitter called and leave my store empty and unlocked, hey. which has happened to me. Um, so and then you know you have to account for the fact that you might not make any money if it, 
if it rains or it's too hot. Um, people go, oh, it's a really hot day, everybody's gonna buy gelato. No, 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 people stay inside with their air conditioning or go out and drink lemonade. Um, uh, we actually do surprisingly well on rainy days in the summer because people have out-of-town guests visiting and they were planning to go to the beach and their plans got canceled and they're looking for a way to salvage the day. Um, so there's more surprises. Um, you know, as time goes on and on, you kind of figure out the trends so you don't panic when people stop coming in. September and August every year, people are buying ice cream on the Cape. <laughs> and when they come back, they've spent a lot more money on the Cape and eaten a lot more calories than they intended to, and so they're on good behavior for, for a little while. <laughs> so you can just count on you know, August and September being slow. Uh, that's how it is, and yeah, so there are a lot of those. Did I at least answer your question? Yeah. Okay, uh, who else? I saw somebody with a hand raised. I may have answered the question that one. Oh, hi. What was this last sample that you gave us? Uh, today's lunch Today's lunch Today's lunch cake. cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gave that once, and it was a real pain, and it came to me. It took a long time, and it was a pain. Yep. Yep. And it didn't have your topping on it. <laughs> Do we have a recipe in there? Nope. No, not at all. It is a um, meringue-based sponge cake, and then it has a blend of sweetened condensed milk, evaporated milk, and heavy cream that's blended together. And we actually weigh it out. We cut the tops off the, um, off the uh, quarts of cream after we make them so that we don't have to, to dirty a ton of extra containers that we have to wash and uh, weigh it back into there. So we, we actually weigh the amount we're gonna use into each container while it's in the oven. And as soon as it comes out of the oven, while it's still hot, so it has to be within about five to 10 minutes, um, you need to poke lots and lots of holes in the tops of every Today's Delicious cake and flood it with, with the three milks. Mm -hmm. Good. And also it's a nice cake, it has a nice texture to it. Yeah. And putting your, it does. your um, Oh, the Today's Delicious is a really nice touch. Yeah. Most people, most people love that. You should be in the chocolate business. You have great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Today's Delicious, I know I've, I've had employees before who were like, oh, I was in downtown Framingham and I saw a Today's Delicious somewhere, so I decided to try it. It wasn't Today's Delicious. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't Today's Delicious. Like, no, 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 it wasn't our Today's Delicious. It's still, well, actually, it's true. A lot of things are not Today's Delicious that claim to be Today's Delicious. And so when you get the cheap ones that taste kind of chalky, um, it is for a reason. Most of those come off a, a truck from one of the big restaurant suppliers or from Restaurant Depot, and they're mass produced. But if you look at the ingredients on them, they use milk and sugar. So they're substituting milk and sugar for sweetened condensed milk, evaporated milk, and heavy cream. Milk and sugar are the cheapest things you can buy. Sweetened condensed milk, the cheapest you can get now, comes in at about $180 a case. <laughs> so. No, uh, there is a Argentinian immigrant family in Miami. So Miami has a huge Argentinian immigrant population that does nothing but make Argentinian style just at Alecha all day. We go through, right now, about three tons a year. So. Really, very good. It's almost like almost as good as your caramel. It just has that lovely consistency and deep taste to it. Well, I actually put a little bit of it in our caramel. Oh, that's it. You're that gets the again. caramel to start forming earlier. It also boosts boosts the protein level in the caramel, so it doesn't stick to your teeth. It took me five or six years to figure out before a, a customer came in and, and said, you know. We have a place on the Cape, and we were down there, and we got desperate for a turtle, so we cheated. It was icky sweet, and it stuck to my teeth. <laughs> so. Well, your caramel's by itself, and people really need to understand it's not that chewy, messy thing. It's, it's not solid, but it's, it stays there, and it's rich, and it's full of flavor, and it's a world unto itself. Well, it is uh, one of the funny things is uh, I've had other candy makers before say, well, how hot do you heat your caramel? And I say, oh, 242. They say, that's too hot. It's going to be too hard. How can it not be too hard? It's like, well, it's final temperature is one thing, but recipe is another. 
<laughs> so it's, it's, you have to consider your fat content, your protein content, your sugar content, your invert sugar content. Everything is important to whether a phase separates and what your final texture is going to be. Uh, it's the other problem, you know, when you make truffles at home, so you make truffle fillings, and you make a ganache. Sometimes your ganache turns out really good, and sometimes your ganache ha is really soft and never sets up, and sometimes it's really firm. And what you don't realize, you, you go to Whole Foods, and I'm, I'm not knocking Whole Foods here, but you buy a chunk of chocolate, and, you know, it tells you who produced it, but it doesn't give you any of the important things. What you have to do is you have to go on to the producer's website, and you have to look up the cocoa butter content and the cocoa content and the sugar content, and you have to adapt your recipe based on the amount of cocoa butter because the cocoa butter to butter fat ratio is what determines how soft or hard it's gonna be and whether it's ever gonna firm up. But uh, you know the recipes that you find online will, will really tell you that you, know, you have to have 40% cocoa butter for this recipe to work. And, and 36 doesn't work and 42 doesn't work. Uh, yep. Do you have a lot of employees and are they you know, longevity employees? I don't have a good, we don't have a good time getting longevity employees. It's very difficult. So, um, you know, the, the problem we have in the food industry in general, I think probably Massachusetts worse than anywhere else is we can't pay enough. It, plain and simple, if you graduated college, you could make more money working somewhere else. If I pay you what you could make in a career where you graduated from college, uh, and almost everybody goes here, or to trade school, and you make more with those careers too, uh, nobody in this room will buy my products if I pay that kind of salary, because I paying you know just just over minimum wage cannot keep my products at a price where most people want to buy them anyway um, uh, wages in massachusetts are very high eggs you know this year the cost of, of egg products in massachusetts because of the new egg law uh, we went from paying forty dollars for 30 pounds of egg whites to paying 110 dollars for 30 pounds of egg whites it, it affects everything uh, electricity goes up. So uh, unfortunately, when you're not getting access, you know, I come from a, a world of PhDs, and that, that was where I spent 20 years of my life, and college graduates, and you have in those positions very motivated people who wanted to get ahead in life. Um, we tend, because of the salaries we can afford to pay, to offer the prices that people are willing to pay, um, you know, we tend to get people who weren't the most motivated and they need some money to, to pay their bills, but they're kind of scraping by. And it's unfortunate. I wish I could pay enough to get highly motivated employees. I'd, I'd kill to, to work with the, the people that I used to work with, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, from, from a motivational, I want to get stuff done perspective. So it's just, it's, it's what we deal with. What it means is I work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And last night I slept on the floor, so I'd have time to, to get the talk together this morning and frost the cakes that had to be done. And I'll probably do that tonight if I want to go to the Natick Farmer's Market tomorrow instead of canceling as well. Because uh, um, you know uh, the cake decorator who would normally help me out cut her finger on Tuesday, so couldn't work yesterday, um, and therefore, so if you're a business owner and you don't have a partner, you you have to know everything uh, because people come to expect certain things from you, and if employee X doesn't show up or says they're sick or does whatever, um, you already promised to make something and it's on you to make it. And you'd rather not call them and tell them you can't make it, so. I'm just glad you and Sam never gave up. It's just a wonderful gift that we have all these wonderful things from yep. both of your determination to be in this business. Yep. A lot of hard work. Uh, the good news is I love doing it. Yeah, so. yeah it's a, it, it helps what the, 
it was a scrambling time, and I, I just yeah. remember those days, and you've worked with so hard, I, I just want to say that. So one of the things that has helped is that my kids did spend the last two years with me. One of my sons, when he graduated college, you know, said, oh, well, you know, it's not a good time to look for a job in, in programming. But so he's been making the gelato for the last two years, but he just went to look for his forever career. And uh, my, my other son doesn't have that motivation and loves cooking and is the one who makes all the dinners. And I'm trying to bring him up in uh, the world of chocolate. but. Uh, you know, even with that, you still can't rely on people the, the way you rely on a, a partner or yourself. So when, when somebody calls out in Framingham, uh, it's a matter of, well, I, I, I had plans to make chocolate today, but I could either close Framingham for three hours until I can find somebody there, or I can go work at Framingham and not make the chocolate. So those are just the decisions I make every day. So yeah, no, running a business is not an easy thing. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules. Um, thank you for saying yes when I emailed you and asked if you would come <laughs> talk to us. And thank you for the delicious um, treats. So just a reminder, thank you all for coming in person and online. Um, uh, Evaluation forms in the back, if you would. Um, and oh, also the literacy department in the library is selling calendars, 2023 calendars. They're in the lobby. You'll see them there in case you're interested. And um, yeah, that's it. Check our website, flyers, uh, newsletter for upcoming programs. And thank you so much for coming today. I'm a good friend of Ellen Lerner. Oh, I, I love Ellen. To, I tried to get her to come today, but she was working. <laughs> okay. But she said to say hi. Okay, I love yeah. Ellen. She's awesome. She is. And, and she was Sam's best store. friend. And I've been in and out of your store lots of times. Excellent. So no, I know you. I've seen you before. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs>